Oh, Samara, this place has long stopped being a town and become a city of millions, the ninth most populous in Russia. But even with a population of that size, the number of aviation design bureaus is incredibly large here, more than a dozen, and all of them work with amphibious aircraft. And where else could the mecca of seaplanes in Russia be if not on the banks of this great river? And by the way, talking about banks, it's time for me to get back on the ground. Vladimir, hello. Hello. So there's an insurmountable obstacle for me between the two of us. What chance of fate brought you here, Alexandra? Me? I came to you on this ship. So will you help me? Yes. Oh. Oh, great. This is a real hero. I've never been transported to a filming location like this before, but you, Vladimir, are accustomed to being on the water because here is your ship and it's not only suited for flight, but for the water as well. Yes. Vladimir, a former military pilot, is now head of a research and production department that builds amphibious aircraft. It's funny, but UFO can also be deciphered as unidentified floating object. Yes, amphibious aircraft have three modes, land, sea, and air. And they're capable of handling all of them. That is, it can take off and land on the water. Yes. The landing gear is retracted and it takes off already in boat mode. So it is, in fact, a flying boat. Yes, a flying boat. But it's also called an amphibian, amphibious aircraft. The versatile amphibian is a land and water aircraft. Retractable landing gear allows for takeoff and landing on different landing strips, and of course, that includes without touching the earth. Taking off and landing on the water is within its capabilities. In its class, this representative is a rather large water bird. Therefore, the wing, no, this aircraft doesn't have wings, but one wing. And this seaplane has a large wing, 204 square feet. It's no wonder the takeoff weight is more than two tons. Two aircraft engines, 180 horses each, help lift it into the air, and the layout of the propulsion system is very unusual. The propellers are not pulling, but pushing, and are located behind the engines. This made it possible to make a transformer cab with a panoramic view. And what a view. Listen. That's right. Well, I gotta say, it turns out this is a whole bus with wings. Yeah, it's a six-seater amphibian. That is three rows of seats. Yes, it can hold six people and 110 pounds of cargo. And part of that load is on its way, though my weight is making this entrance a bit difficult. All right, be careful. I'm getting in. Okay. Well, if we're not taking off, let's sail. Am I really going to steer this thing? Just don't say anything to Vladimir yet. Shh. Vladimir is not only one of the creators of the seaplane, but he's also one of the first test pilots of it too. Let's put on the headsets. Shut the door. That's what I call being responsible. So I've turned on the battery pack. Start. Off we go. In all my experience with planes, I've never flown in a seaplane. So you ready? Okay. The exclusivity of what is happening also lies in the fact that this aircraft is still the only prototype made so far and is still undergoing its flight and sailing tests. That's it? We're already sailing? Yes, you and I are already sailing. This is a very unusual feeling, especially when you see the water is almost up to, right up to the glass. Awesome. Now we retract the landing gear and wait for it to complete that. So now we're turning into a boat? Yes. With wings. What do I mean boat? It's almost a submarine. Due to the plane's layout, its construction, we're almost half submerged in the water. sense, seaplanes were ordinary planes that had been placed on floats. That's how it was at first. And there's a whole ocean of these types of planes in the world right now. But the largest Russian seaplane is the MBR-2. The schematic is already familiar to us, a single-winged seaplane with a pushing propeller. In 32 years, 1,365 aircrafts like this were produced, meaning the schematic is reliable.
and on the water, you see, we are almost in no way inferior to regular boats. Even better then. Now I will demonstrate the reverse speed, like in a car. Look at the propellers. One of them begins to rotate in the opposite direction. This is how it reverses, and the planes pulled in the opposite direction. That's it. In reverse gear, we can spin all you like, then switch back again and go forward. That is, you turn on reverse and then we sort of back up, yes? Yes. These German reversible propellers of course drive up the price, but at least the seaplane is independent when taking off and is easily controlled even in bad weather. Very convenient, because there are different kinds of winds when taking off. And so, on the water, you're not afraid of the wind, and you can maneuver the plane yes. as you like. You can get away from other vessels. Yes, yes. Not only airborne ones, but also exclusively waterborne ones. Dancing on the water is certainly impressive, but it's time, I'd say, to change elements. Our airplane is warmed up. Everything is in order. You can start steering right away. Yes, steer with the left pedal. I'm steering? Yes, to the left, yes. End engines. And here on the water, you need yes, to... Yes, to the left, yes. End engines. I'll assist you in your steering now. So right pedal to the center. The airplane's pedals are responsible for the vertical rudder. Here, the tail, or rather the keel, works like the rudder of an ordinary boat. And the air compensates for slippage. And on the water, it helps with turning around and it helps out the engines. That's it, we're bringing it up to speed. Hands on the yoke. Speeding up, I will pull to the left a little, that's it, steer. We're starting to hydroplane, we're hydroplaning. This means we're literally starting to float on the water. Towards you, one, wow. see, both. You see, as we gain speed, we start to break away from the surface. As they say here, we get up on the step. This is referring to the ledge along the bottom of the fuselage, which reduces the area of contact with the water. Resistance falls, speed increases. We'll now reach 55 miles per hour. Steer, 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 everything's fine. Well, shall we fly? Let's fly. Woohoo! After we reach 60 miles per hour, the water begins to release us. I, of course, let go of the yoke, and Vladimir launches another mechanism, here they are, the flaps, to increase the lift of the plane, and the flying boat, as if reluctantly, goes ahead and soars into the sky. That's it, we're about to hit 90 miles per hour. Put away the flaps. Speed 110, speed 125, 135. But in general, they even joke about seaplanes as if it were impossible to build an ideal seaplane. After all, what helps them sail gets in the way of them flying. Because this thing is hiding a whole mess of stuff under the water, that is, this is a boat, which as a result, when it rises out of the water, surely ruins your life as a designer, at least a little bit. So this is what the conversation was about, the search for a compromise. Vladimir Shevchenko, as chief designer of the amphibious aircraft, knows all about compromises. Flying boats are always a challenge for their creators. But the midplane is the compensation for this. The center of gravity on this aircraft is close to the edge of the wing. That is, as if in the very center of the plane. Quite right. It's located in the very center of the aircraft, which affects its handling. It responds to changes in the position of the steering wheel very precisely, very proportionally and quickly, almost instantly. One pilot who flew this plane said, this is an ordinary hydropilot. Really? Really. Preparing for landing, course 300 feet. We accelerate the airplane. Okay. We're up to 105 miles per hour. We bank to the side. Oh, wow. Isn't this dangerous, dipping to the side like this? The plane's able to. Even at this angle? The angle's normal. Yep, it can angle up to 70 degrees. I didn't expect such agility and complex aerobatics from a seaplane. Wow. Oh, wow. 
Wow, my knees are trembling. Wow, whoa, 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 whoa. But not only did the designers come up with the schematic and a powerful engine, they also added something else very unusual. Look at the plane from below. Notice anything? It has swept back wings. What does swept back mean? Swallows, birds, you've seen them, they fly like this. Uh-huh. That's just swept. Now if they fly like this, then they are swept back. Okay, but birds don't fly like that, right? I know, this is how our plane flies. All aircraft have a curved wing profile. This is how the incoming airflow is directed under the wing. From above, the pressure drops, and from below, it increases and a lifting force is formed. This compensates for the weight of the aircraft, which ensures a vertical lift. For horizontal, it's also necessary to compensate for air resistance. That's balanced by the thrust, which the engines are responsible for. If all forces are compensated for, the flight is smooth and stable. But if the thrust were to be removed, a plane with a forward sweep begins to fall, losing control, because the stream of air rushes off the wing edge, interfering with the fins. And a back swept wing makes the air bend around the plane in a radically different way. Thanks to the fact that the wings are swept back, the stall of the flow of air occurs at the base, and the tips of the wings steadily carry the aircraft. That is, let it lower down, let it drop, but it's controllable. And that's what saves you because if you lose this control and wobble next to the water, then in general, it's not going to end well. It's just letting you drop. At the very least, there won't be a crash. The wing won't list, which could lead to unpleasant consequences. This plane is so forgiving that I didn't even have to persuade Vladimir to let me take the wheel. Take it. Seriously? I can steer? Yes, yes, yes. Like this. Of course, holding the yoke while under close supervision. Oh. <sighs> Isn't the same as flying, but it's still an incredible feeling. Oh my goodness. They're on the right. I'm flying a plane right now. Yes. The helm is controlled by ailerons, movable elements on the wingtips. If we want to turn right, the aileron on the right deviates up, the wing goes down, the plane turns to the right. The plane stays horizontal by the same principle, but through the work of the tail unit, not the ailerons. When the yoke is pulled toward you, the elevators are raised up, and the plane, as if pushing off from the air, jumps up. Push it away, and it's the opposite. The plane rushes towards the ground. It's always seemed to me that it would be easier to fly a plane than a helicopter. Now I can say that's not true because the wheel's in motion all the time. Oh, wow, this is an overload. Even simply swerving around at sunset over the Volga is very impressive. I can say this for sure. Vladimir and his co-workers built an excellent plane. All that's left is to work out the kinks in the intercom. Due to interference, I can barely hear you. That's why the sound quality is so bad. It was just like at the dawn of seaplane aviation, almost a silent movie. But even if I could be heard, the flight left me speechless. We're going in for the landing. The engines are quieter. Why? Because I cut the speed. They're cut to almost an idle. RPMs are at a minimum, flaps are at a maximum, the speed decreases, and the river, here it is, is getting closer and closer. But there are no markings on it. Therefore, the glider pilots have a special eye. They say they feel the water. Aligning, just don't be scared. Sit there calmly. OK. To be honest, the looming water looks pretty intimidating, but... Wow, listen, that was a soft landing. Softer than on a typical strip, even. But at these speeds, the density of the water for us is the same as asphalt. But this landing strip is 2,174 miles long, and it offers endless possibilities. Yeah, there's always a runway under you, everywhere. Take off whenever. Take off whenever, take off whenever. And you can set down wherever. 
and you can set down wherever, no matter what, it's convenient. It's called freedom, just complete freedom. Engineer Enrico Forlanini created this boat in 1905. It's called a hydrofoil. The 75 horsepower engine accelerated the boat to 50 miles per hour. Here, the hydrofoil jumped out of the water, becoming almost an aircraft on its hydrofoils and leaving sluggish steamers behind. But still, it didn't soar into the sky. We, on the other hand, flew. Woohoo! Yes, another takeoff, and again in Samra. Nothing special here. And one more specificity of seaplanes, we're now all sitting here with bare feet, even without sandals, because we all came from the beach. But the plane, like its pilot, is different. Peter Trush, unlike the seaplane, is not a local. He flew in for a flying boat from Kaliningrad. I used to have two planes. I sold one of them, and with the money I earned from that sale, I went and bought a car. I added a little money and bought a car. Uh-huh. We live on the coast, so we need an airplane like this. This plane has been taking to the air since 2009. Several dozen of this model have already been built. The schematic is a classic one. It's a high altitude plane with the wing on top and the propellers don't push, but pull. They're driven by two engines with 140 horses each, but the keel is unusual. The V-shaped rudder improves aerodynamics and the monocoque fuselage made of carbon and fiberglass makes the whole construction lighter. That's why the seaplane weighs only 1,700 pounds. And at the same time, look what it gets up to. It can withstand angles of 90 degrees and without any reduction in speed. It's quite, uh, let's say, an impressive characteristic of this aircraft. Not every regular plane can do this. It's very maneuverable. It, Whoa. It's easily controlled. This is all normal. Even when flying horizontal over the water, there's almost always a bit of shaking. Due to the uneven heating of the liquid, the air above it warms up unevenly as well. So there is, as the pilots say, clear air turbulence. It's okay. These are these, uh, these are technical strains. Okay. Our plane, we have a parachute here, just so you know, Alexander, look. You don't have one that, uh, it's for the whole plane. Just in case, let's say. Really? What, uh, yes, in the event of an unforeseen situation, the plane descends by parachute, it's sat down. Yeah, that's better than a helmet. Not only is it extremely safe, this plane, though powerful, is quite economical. At the same time, I let up on the gas. I set, I set the pitch of the propeller so that the flight will be more economical. Now, if we look here, you see our fuel consumption is currently about six gallons at a speed of 136 miles per hour. Six gallons per hour? Yes, yes, at, at full speed, at full speed, yes. Incredible. Yes, our speed is 136 at the same time. Why do you like seaplanes? Well, the feeling of water and land, all three elements at the same time, everything is, it's impossible to explain it. You just need to experience it. And only then the understanding comes that this is just, well, generally a magnificent, crazy thing. But how does one wisely construct this crazy flying object? So from what, from what are these seaplanes made? Renat, hello. Hello. I know that you'll tell me everything. And so I understand that here it is, the basis of any flying boat. Yes. It looks like a boat. Well, let's say it's not quite the basis. This is an integral part of the seaplane. This is its bottom, with which it comes into contact with the water. So what is it made of? The guys here are sanding something with sandpaper, yes? Can I also participate? Yes, of course. Just like this then? I see it takes some elbow grease. Yes. It's not gold. Well, almost. But what is it made of? Various composite materials and fillers. Come on, I'll show you. All right, a table. Looks like a setup for a fabric cutter here. Well, for example, this is styrofoam. It's used as a filler. 
Okay, listen, but styrofoam... For three-layer panels. And the plane is somehow... And here is the three-layer panel itself. Meaning? This is composite material, and this is composite material. And inside is this same styrofoam. Styrofoam's inside, but it's not your basic styrofoam, it's special. Here. Okay, and this is what you get. The result is a lightweight and durable panel. Listen, it's really light. It weighs nothing at all. Did you say, are you saying that this is what the plane is made of? Yes, even Airbus and Boeing are now making wings out of this. In the lingo of professionals, this is called a sandwich, and the outsides of the sandwich are made of fabric, either glass or epoxy pressure impregnated carbon fiber. And what would happen if it was made of, I don't know, steel, for example? While made of steel, it wouldn't fly. It can be made from aluminum, but aluminum is prone to corrosion. Uh huh. That's why plastic is a very good material for seaplanes. The resulting parts are assembled in an adjacent workshop, like a huge construction set. Wow. Renat, the scale of your work is becoming clear. What kind of part is this? This is the lower shell of the wing. One large wing. The wing is one piece, more than 40 feet long. For seaplanes, a wing with a large surface area is important in order to quickly get away from the water. Water creates a lot of resistance to take off. That is, you could say it pulls, yes. holds the plane down, yes. doesn't want to let it go. And here's the finished fuselage itself. You can hear that it's made of plastic, uh-huh. And you can already see that it's monocoque, but it doesn't even have the doors yet. The seaplane, as it splashes down on the water, all the exits, all the doors are lifted up. Well, you could say they are hatches. Uh-huh, that is, there it is, one hatch. Yes. And there, if I understand correctly, will be another yes, hatch? Yes, an additional hatch. This plane is almost ready. It remains to be painted, and then it can fly. It seems simple enough, but this work takes almost six months. This is very hard manual labor, very painstaking, and the product is quite exclusive, therefore it's not produced very quickly. And have you flown one yourself? Of course. Is there really nothing comparable to flying in a seaplane? Well, maybe a flight into space. The landing gear's been released, the lock's opened. There's the strip, see it? Yeah, I see it. The ground is seen out the window. This is the main charm of amphibians. You take off from the water and land back on land. Oh! And there you go, the seaplane is on land. Yeah, this plane is dry for once, but pilot Sasha is soaking wet. Even like this, you can't bypass the ground. By the way, amphibians can get back on land in very different ways. Landing gear is down, and we'll gently make our way to the shore. More gas. Yes, there's something very captivating about this world of the three elements. It's as if the boundaries are blurred, like the sand. And there's something very primordial about it, too. Just like ancient amphibians, we finally crawled our way out of the water. Well then, high five? You flew perfectly. <laughs> Thanks. Oh yeah, no, 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 take it back. <laughs> Piloting flying machines without any experience is the hardest task to tackle, because in addition to forward backward and right left, another more frightening axis is added, up, down. And this height for me as a beginner, of course, is unattainable but it gives rise to a sense of freedom, and a three-dimensional one at that, where flight is possible and it's especially magical if this flight bypasses the ground. <laughs>